Hello, I'm Valerie Cousin. And I'm Gary Heine. And we're the Food Growing People, and we're here with one of our favorite people, Dr. Z. And Gary's going to tell you a little bit about him if you haven't had the pleasure of meeting him before. Yes. Uh, Dr. Z, also known as uh, John Zahina Ramos, was one of the most popular speakers on our Grow Your Own Food Summit uh, last summer. And he's a food grower of many um, years experience living in balmy West Palm Beach Florida although I'm hearing it's not as balmy as uh, you'd like it down there uh, and he's also a scientist and he uh, got interested in actually quantifying the effect of growing your own food and how it affects a household and how it affects a human uh, a community and he's written a book um, uh, talking about that and the last time we talked the book was just being written so we're really excited to hear about his new book which is called Just One Backyard, One Man's Search for Food Sustainability. Dr. Z, it's so great to, uh, to see you again. Thanks Gary, it's a pleasure to speak with you again. Yeah, I wonder if you could uh, just tell folks a little bit about how this whole, I know this is a long story, but just uh, the highlights of how this whole idea of you turning from a food grower into a um, scientist who's actually quantifying the effect of food growing on humans and their communities. Sure. Um, I'm from a food growing family, from food growing heritage. My grandfather homesteaded a piece of Iowa prairie in the 1800s. And oh. when I was young, uh, my mother was born and raised on the farm, and when I was young, uh, my parents would corral us into the car and drive us out to the country, out to the farm, to the old homestead. And we did have a small plot out there that was fenced in to keep the bunnies and the deer out. And we grew our food there, but it kept us in touch with our agricultural roots. And uh, that farm passed down through the generations. My cousin still owns that farm, and he's going to deed the land over to his children when he passes. And uh, so food growing has always been in our family. We've always had a vegetable garden in the city where we lived, as well as out in the country. I was born and raised on local food and on sustainably raised food and on self-provisioned food, self-grown food. And then at the age of 18, six weeks after I graduated from high school, I picked up lock, stock, and barrel and moved to West Palm Beach, Florida, a place I had never been to before, a whole different climate, and I came down here to go to college. And at that point, uh, this was in 1979, the United States was undergoing an interesting transition then. Uh, supermarkets were becoming widespread across the country. I remember when they first came into my hometown and they put a lot of our small neighborhood grocery stores out of business. And along with the supermarkets came the shopping mall, the enclosed shopping mall that started to sprout up across the country. And what those two commercial entities did is that they consolidated a lot of different products under one roof and then they looked for discounts but in order to get the discounts they had to start shipping goods in from long distances our local stores were focused primarily on local goods and locally produced goods and these new big box stores and malls shifted the whole dynamic in favor of produce that was grown cheaply in rural areas where it had never really been grown much before and in importing a lot of products from places where they could get it much more inexpensively thereby taking a lot of the production and the benefits of that away from the local community so I moved to West Palm and during that time we were undergoing that same transition here when I had moved here Palm Beach County produced one-fourth to one-fifth of all winter vegetables consumed in this country. Wow. And there was a population here of about 350,000 people, perhaps 400,000 people. Today, we are at 1.3, approaching 1.4 million people. And a good deal of those vegetable fields are gone. They've been paved over for residential development. And we have transitioned into an economy that's very much based on imported goods and services from other regions of the country and other parts of the world. 
And so within a few years after moving to Florida, I had completely changed my lifestyle to be entirely dependent on grocery store food and everything yeah. had to be purchased as opposed to how I was raised where we made for ourselves. And uh, as years went on, I eventually bought a home and had a vegetable garden in the backyard and it never did particularly well because I was still growing things how we grow them in Iowa and that's not a very smart thing to do when you're down in a tropical climate because things are really different here. So eventually I adapted and um, I bought a, a home during the height of the, the uh, great housing bubble which tells you more about the house than you probably need to know. <laughs> but, uh, it was a rundown home and uh, I renovated the interior and the exterior I looked at it and uh, the the area around the house it's a typical urban lot about a quarter acre and I thought about what to do with the backyard the front yard I fixed it up to look nice but I looked at the backyard and I had a vegetable garden and every year it got a little bigger because I never was growing all the things I wanted to grow in it and one day I sat down and looked at it and I thought back to my aunt uh, when I was a child we would drive out to the country every single month and visit an aunt my mother's oldest sister now she was born in 1897 and she lived how they lived in the old world in the old country because her parents were from Luxembourg and Germany and it was like going to a natural, I'm sorry, a living history museum. She grew all of her own food. Her entire backyard was a vegetable garden. And there were flowers, but they were relegated to odd areas. They didn't have the lofty position in the garden the vegetables did. And every time we left there, we always left with cardboard boxes overflowing with vegetables and canned goods from her garden. And when I looked at my own backyard, I kind of was interested in that contrast between then and today and I thought you know and this was kind of funny is that the only place in my backyard that I didn't have a weed patch was my vegetable garden so if I expanded my vegetable garden out and take up a good part of the backyard well by gosh that would solve my weed problem and um, it wasn't such an absurd idea because I'd actually seen that growing up and then it started to click with me that, well, can we still do that today? I mean, here was a woman, my aunt, who grew virtually all the vegetables and fruits that she needed in her backyard. She got the meat off the farm because they were in rural areas and her brothers had farms. Can we still do that today? I mean, it, it's such a strange idea to most people living in cities that, you know, your backyard should be grass, right? So I thought, well, let me give that a try. I, I think I'm going to do this, but as a scientist, is it really worth it was a, was a question that I wanted to ask. Um, I, I've known people who have put in vegetable gardens. They were so frustrated because they would go to a big box store at garden center and they would buy a potted tomato for like $4 or $6 and then they would bring it home and it would bear three tomatoes or five tomatoes or something so each tomato cost them probably a dollar right so you can go to a local supermarket and buy them much cheaper than that and the whole idea of growing your own food is usually predicated today on the concept of it's better quality but nobody thinks about it in terms of is it worth it financially right so if I was going to be growing all this food, I wanted to know, was it worthwhile in terms of money? And then it kind of snowballed into, well, is it worthwhile in terms of the time you spend? And is it worthwhile in terms of this, that, and environmental and ecological and so on and so forth? So uh, I did design a study, and the backyard turned into mostly vegetable garden, about two-thirds of it. And the other third I left as a sort of prairie garden so that I could have birds and butterflies and pollinators and all kinds of other things going on there other than grass so that I didn't have to cut grass because I just wasn't a fan of that. So uh, that's what I did. And for five years I collected an awful lot of data and uh, came up with some really fun things. But what I liked most about it is it really did reconnect me with my heritage and my background uh, that I recall from being young and that was an intangible benefit that was so important to me at least as important as the food and right. so um, when I hit my five-year point I decided I would stop there 
and I would pull all this information together and I'd write it and put it together in a book and that's the book that I've written. Um, but I, I wanted to be sure that when I wrote the book it wasn't a scientific treatise. It was a story. It was a journey, a human story about yeah. my life and how I came up through uh, homegrown food and locally grown food and then lost that connection and then was able to rediscover it in my own backyard. And then, yeah. so the human story is there, and, and I interviewed a lot of people and included those interviews in the book to give a lot of different perspectives from around the world. I have interviews from people from Australia and uh, Canada and Scotland and throughout the United States and have visited community gardens throughout the United States and tell some of their stories as well. So we're all united by our love of food, love of growing food, but then I introduce into the book the results of my backyard study and how this goes so much farther beyond our own backyards and how it helps us regionally in our economies and for our health and our ecological and environmental welfare. Wow. So it's it has some you know fake facts and figures in it um, but it is more than anything else a human story because isn't that what food is all about? Yes. Yes. The thing that binds us. So hopefully you got to travel to a lot of those cool places that you mentioned when you did all of your interviews. You didn't have to do them all on the uh, Skype or on the phone. Uh, I'm sure it's I, when I've been in Europe, there's just the, the organic food in those places seems to me so much more uh, real because it seems the land is so much more real because it's uh, it's old it feels older the the architecture everything feels older so I just love love that interaction with the food in in Europe and England especially is uh, really magical so I'm glad to hear that you've got to have some of those stories put in there I wanted to hear a little bit about. Um, the details of just a maybe a few little strokes about what you found in your backyard about the numbers about how much food you could produce about how much, many hours how much water that kind of thing just to give a little a little taste of that sure um, the first year that I grew I started uh, in December November December 2009 and I grew up until the summer started here. Now, I, I know that most people in the Northern Hemisphere are going to say, well, that's odd because we usually plant in the spring and then harvest in the fall. Well, down here in South Florida, our climate is different, of course. We plant in the fall and we harvest and close the gardens down in the spring because it gets too hot. And most people don't grow much over the summer. Now, you can grow tropical vegetables, but to be honest with you, uh, I am from the north, and I really love the idea of not gardening 12 months a year. Yeah. It's really great to have that break. And so our break here occurs in the summer. Uh, one thing about growing down here is that it is not an easy climate to grow in. Our soils here are very sterile, nutrient poor. I'm growing in pure sand, and it has taken me some time to condition that sand uh, to yield a decent crop. We grow during our dry season, so we must have irrigation. And we have a lot of tropical pests and diseases here that are not very kind. And so it is much more of a battle to grow the, the traditional fruits and vegetables that most people are familiar with in the northern climates down here in South Florida. Um, so the things that I've produced here and the volumes that I've produced here, I would like to say that it's pretty comparable to other parts of the country. Our growing season for those vegetables are no longer than your growing season in Louisville or in Chicago or New York City, to be honest with you. So um, my first year I grew oh, 120, 150 pounds of vegetables, and I was really proud of that, given that I had so many challenges and a steep learning curve to get over because I was changing everything that I knew about how to grow food from how we did it in Iowa <laughs> and coming down here to an entirely different environment. Uh, the second year I was faced with a lot of challenges. We had a record drought while I was during the growing season. We had the uh, driest period on record during that growing season. We had the hottest 
temperatures on record. We had a hurricane. We had frost. I don't think the climate could have thrown one more thing at me that season. Yeah. And yet, I outproduced the season before. So when I got to the end of the second season, I was thinking, well, uh, I was hoping only to do this study for a year or two, but since both years were not very kind, I need a good year, a regular, ordinary, normal year to grow in to get some idea of how much can be produced. And fortunately for the three years after that, that's what I got. Um, uh, two, uh, last year I produced around 500 pounds of vegetables out of that backyard garden that was about 1,000 square feet. The year before, I produced combined fruits and vegetables out of my garden, 1,130 pounds. Good gosh, it's awesome. And it's nice. Um, yeah. What I've done is converted those numbers over to servings as defined by the United States Department of Agriculture's Choose My Plate guidelines so that I could answer the question is, can you feed somebody with that? How close can you come to meeting the recommended dietary intake of five different kinds of vegetables plus fruits according to the USDA for a healthy diet. And indeed, in a backyard garden of around 1,000 or 1,200 square feet here, and I don't know why this would be possible up in the northern, more northern climates, uh, Chicago down to the south, uh, where you have a, a nice growing season and decent soils and conditions that these plants really like to grow in. They don't particularly like to grow in a tropical climate because they're not from here. You can grow enough vegetables and fruits within your backyard or within your home land to feed up to two people. And, and what that means is to grow enough fruits and vegetables to meet the recommended dietary intake of fruits and vegetables for the year out of those gardens. That's a big deal because that's what people used to do 125 years ago before we had this industrialized system where we were bringing food in from rural areas. People did grow a lot of food locally and so it's really nothing more than kind of going back to the way things used to be. Yes, and how much time did that that take? And that's uh, I love hearing that that those numbers. It feels uh, within reach. And want to know for people who are working in a job or in other kinds of things, how much time it actually takes. Yeah, great question because uh, that is something I often hear from people who are afraid to really throw themselves into food gardening. Is oh my gosh, it takes so much time, and I have family, I have job, I have responsibilities, I have a life. So I did measure that, and it came down to about $12 per hour return for every hour I worked in the garden, about $12. And oh, So meaning that it took, with those 1,000 pounds, that it was $12,000 or 1,000 tw hours, is that what you're saying? Over no. Uh, on, average for, <laughs> on average, for every hour I worked, I got about $12 worth of produce back. Okay. And that was conventional agriculture prices but I'm growing everything using organic methods. And I also priced things out according to organic prices. And it's around $20 per hour with organic prices. Now, these are very conservative estimates. The reality is uh, I had to hand water everything because I was tracking water use. And a normal gardener would not have done that. And that added into the time a great deal. So if you had a sprinkler system or some kind of an irrigation system or you don't need to water nearly as much as we need to water down here with our heat and sun, um, your return per hour would be two to three times that. Wow, that's incredible. And that can make a big difference in a household budget, not for higher income people necessarily, but certainly for moderate to low income households. I've calculated up that the savings to the household per year when accumulated over a 30-year period, which is the average length of a home loan, mm -hmm. you would have saved enough money by not purchasing that food to have paid for a home. Wow. 
a modest total. Yeah. Yeah. So you can start to convert these numbers over into other things. Uh, I also tracked where the fruit and vegetables in the store were coming from that I was growing so I could calculate up how much energy was being saved. And this would be petroleum oil that was not burned in the transport of that food to my city from the place that it was grown. Because the food was grown locally and right in my backyard, I didn't have to drive to the store to purchase it, but neither did a semi you know, tractor trailer have to drive the food 1,400 miles to get here, which was about the average distance that the food in the grocery store was coming from. And so given the amount that I was growing in terms of its weight and the amount of energy that would be needed to transport that, just that distance from the farm field to the store, this is not including the energy needed to grow the food using industrial methods such as you know plows and harvesters and uh, storage in cool uh, storage and uh, other kinds of things. The amount of energy that my backyard food garden saved per year was equivalent to enough electricity to run my household for the year, the average American household for a year. It was also equivalent to enough gasoline, unleaded gasoline, to take my vehicle off the road for three to four months a year. Um, wow. So, yeah, it, it's it's not small stuff. No. And, so really extrapolating the, t the your time, obviously, is, has a dollar value, but it also has an environmental impact that's so huge that so many people feel helpless about how they can actually do anything that yes. this one thing, obviously, as we've said many times before, just has so many absolutely unimaginable outcomes that are beneficial for us and for the planet. Absolutely. The real power of this uh, is in its extrapolation out to the community. Uh, just one more thing about the energy, that also translated to a ton of carbon dioxide emissions for the year that I avoided emitting to the atmosphere just by my food choices. The real power of this is not my one backyard. The real power of this is the combined benefits of all of our backyards. During the days of the Victory Gardens, World War II, the United States and Britain produced enough fruits and vegetables in their Victory Gardens to meet about 50% of the food demand for the population within those countries at that time. The reason that Victory Gardens were promoted by the respective governments is because the governments recognized that growing food in rural areas, transporting it into cities, and growing food using industrial methods used energy and other resources and that they needed to conserve those resources. In that case, it was to dedicate them to the war effort. But today, we realize that our resources are getting scarce and that we want to conserve them. So we can do the same things and the government can, if they would get behind this, we could restore the community gardens and the victory gardens back in our communities. And there was an estimated 30 million victory gardens in the United States at that time. When you start to look at my one backyard and the environmental and economic benefits of that, and you multiply that by 30 million, you start to see how this accumulates into a lot of savings. In terms of energy savings, it's equivalent to taking around five or six coal power plants offline in terms of the amount of emissions saved wow. the atmosphere. Huh. And by doing nothing more than promoting growing food in our cities. Mm -hmm. So think of the money that we spend on trying to make vehicles more efficient and, we, and on phasing out coal-powered, uh, coal-fueled power plants. And something as simple as a program that promotes community gardens and growing food in your own backyards, um, we're going to get quite a bang for the buck out of this. And, but besides the benefits, it tells us how much we lost when we lost the Victory Gardens. Right. Yeah. So how can someone do what you did? Just plant. <laughs> <laughs> I made the choice not to put 
lawn in my backyard. And the reason is because I don't like cutting grass. I cut it for years. Uh, when I lived up north, it was fine because you did it for, you know, in Iowa, you might have four months. And so by the time you really get tired of it, it's done. And then you'll come back to it again uh, next year. But down here, we're looking at 12 months of the year. And you have to mow your lawn here every other week during the dry season and every single week during the rainy season, half of the year, six months. And it's hot, <laughs> 90 degrees, high humidity, rainy season, I'm not doing it. And then to pay someone to do it, my gosh, it's going to cost you $100 a month and sometimes more to have that lawn service. So um, I opted not to have a backyard lawn. And instead, I planted it with a, a wildflower prairie garden that doesn't need water and it doesn't need a lot of maintenance. Uh, once a year, I'll go in and clean it out and primp it up. And then the food garden, so plant. Just put in a garden, start small, and start with the things you like, and start simple. The first year, it's going to be some challenges, and you'll work your way through the challenges, and you're going to find other people in your area who have faced those challenges and solved them if you feel like you can't get through them. Community gardens are wonderful resources for information and people who have experience that will help you get through the issues that you face if you choose to grow in your own backyard. So that's, that's the thing is just get started. The second year you'll get more confident and you'll find things that you'll want to grow that you haven't tried before. And it'll just keep going from there. Um, I mentioned the lawn maintenance service. There are going to be some people who just simply are incapable or don't have the interest in growing their own food. But they want those vegetables and fruits. I'm a big advocate of us promoting the idea, us meaning the, this country, is promoting the idea of retraining our lawn maintenance people to maintain our backyard food gardens for us. Oh, what a great idea. paying them to come here and cut grass on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't want to or are incapable of it, they're coming anyway. Why don't they just maintain the garden for you and you get, a, you get your vegetables? And it's something that's going to pay you instead of cost you because it's going to be producing food for you that you're not going to need to purchase at the grocery store. And it may actually produce enough to pay for the cost of having somebody maintain it. So we have a bit of a shift here that I'd like to see us take in this country, but uh, it's not impossible. In fact, it's quite possible. Yeah. <clears throat> I love that idea. I've, I've thought about all the people that maintain lawns, uh, cutting and putting chemicals on them um, around the country and, and wondered what they would do if suddenly people lost interest in that and that's a great idea to have them actually grow in some food. Yes. Um, just a, a little interesting statistic. The amount of lawn area in the United States, if I'm getting this number right, remembering right, 49,000 square miles of lawn in the United States. This is equivalent to, and let me think if I can recall these, the combined total area of Washington, D.C., New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Hawaii. Yes, all of those combined. When you think about that, um, that is only one... The amount of vegetable producing fields in this country is one-seventh of that area. So we have seven times the amount of area in this country dedicated to growing lawn than we have dedicated, dedicate, dedicated to growing vegetables. If we just took a third of that lawn area and converted it to food production, to fruit and vegetables, in our own backyards, a third of our lawns, we would be producing all the fruits and vegetables this country needs without having to bring them in from anywhere else or grow them in rural areas. That's a pretty amazing thing. Yeah. It is. And I, I have heard of some services that have been popping up uh, doing edible landscape as that kind of service right. in 
in bigger cities in California, especially. I've heard of a lot of it going on. Young entrepreneurs that are creating those kinds of businesses of saying, "I'll come in and set up your your food growing system. We'll come in and maintain it, and you get all the bounty from it." Good. Yeah. Yeah, Great. so that's I, I hope that there are more of those kinds of transitions that go on because the, the, this is how the change is going to happen is for us to all be doing these kinds of things that we forget we even have the power to, to do. That's right. Um, California's an interesting case study. Uh, in Florida, we have a rainy season and a dry season, and down here in South Florida, we get around five feet of rain a year. So we can refill our aquifers and we can refill our supplies for the dry season. They don't do that in California. The, um, there was a concern voiced by a scientist that I had read that felt that we should not move food production into urban areas because it will further drain water resources because urban areas already are stretched on water supplies and adding one more straw into the supply would break the camel's back. I measured that. The amount of water needed to grow those vegetables in my backyard was equivalent to the amount of water that evaporates off of a swimming pool each year. <laughs> okay, we've got the water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and if the, the the common sense of putting in gray water systems becomes more in vogue, that that will also Absolutely. change the dynamic of recycling of water that is possible and potable for those kinds of uses. Absolutely. Mm, yeah. And Doctor Doctor Z, what sort of uh, response are you getting to your work? Oh, it's positive. Uh, uh -huh. What I hope it does is inspires and encourages, and I'm looking forward to pushing it into academia. This book is what they call a trade book. This is a book for the average person to read and to be inspired. It's an advocacy book. It's, a, it's part memoir. It's got some science in it, and it's, a, it's a, just a nice, gentle read. Um, but what's coming on its heels is the science book. I'm also writing uh, a technical book that has all the methods in it and all the hard data in it and that's intended for academia and to spur research and more focus in academia on this very thing about urban food production. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I love the way you've connected all the pieces, so many pieces. Uh, um, I remember you saying that you used to, your interest as a doctoral candidate was in ecology, but then you realized that you felt like that was sort of out there. We think of ecology as out there, you know, the environment, but you were bringing it home and bringing it to your backyard and uh, yeah. connected the food growing efforts with the uh, energy use and uh, transportation costs and the water use and, and whether we can actually have the land in our communities to actually grow the food that we need, which you measured. You, you've been doing a lot of measuring. A lot of measuring. <laughs> yeah. I'd appreciate that. The science aside, it just feels good. People come together over food. I have food events in my backyard, and people come, and they look at the garden. They, rip, they get down, they bend over, and they touch the plants, and they say, oh, I remember going to my grandmother's house, and I loved going there over the summers, and she had such a beautiful garden, and yeah. I miss that. So there's this emotional connection people have with vegetable gardens that is really important. There's a real connection there with their heritage and to a lot of great memories in their lives of, of people who are gone. And we can't understate the importance of that. The science is great, but we really have uh, this aspect to our food and to our, our food growing that is completely lacking in our industrialized system. Yeah, so you brought together the intangible benefits of food growing and the tangible benefits. I'm thinking it's like a love story. You've written a love story. Very yeah. much so. Very much yeah. so. Yeah. And, and you have a great newsletter uh, that you send out where you talk about what's going on in the garden and mm -hmm. uh, just wanted people to know that. Is, is that uh, they can sign up for that at justonebackyard.com? Justonebackyard.com or I'm transitioning the site over to justonebackyard.net. So okay. either one of those will work. They're interchangeable. 
And when you get there to justonebackyard.com or .net, you can look over on the left-hand side of the web page and you'll click a little button and you can sign up for the North American Urban Food Growers Newsletter, uh, which is focused in a more temperate zone and uh, southern regions of the United States. And then I do have a special one just for people in South Florida because our climate here is completely different from anywhere else. So I developed an entirely different newsletter just for those folks because we are really different. <laughs> a whole different world here. So, uh, feel, yeah, I would love to have um, folks sign up and we keep connected that way. Yeah. Great. So make, make sure you get John's book. We'll have the link in the email and under this video. Um, just one backyard, one man's search for food sustainability. And uh, I know it's going to be chock full of wonderful stories. And uh, we got to see a little. Why don't you hold up your copy there so we can see it? <laughs> That's right. All right. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Full of pictures, yeah. So great to have you, um, Dr. Z. You're always a pleasure to talk to. Is there any parting comments you wanted to make before we go? Not really. Um, it's just been a pleasure to speak with you again. Always enjoy it, and you're doing such great work. I, I'm so appreciative to be associated with you and your work. Thank, Thank you. you so much, John. You, everybody out there, grow more food. It grow changes more. the world. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.